question is, does anybody have any questions from last time? Okay. Then uh, we'll go back to uh, this main uh, process we we're talking about, which was a form factor involving an operator, which is also involved in Higgs boson production at the LHC. Um, and it produces a couple of gluons, but then those gluons can interact through the nonlinear interactions of QCD or N equals 4 super Yang mills, as we're going to be discussing, and uh, produce different uh, form factors. And, and there's one sort of, uh, we could call it the Goldilocks process, because it's not too complicated and it's not too simple. And, and that was, um, we have this operator which involves a gluon field strength, um, two of them, summed over the colors. And then we consider a quantity which is the um, matrix element of that operator with uh, three uh, gluon uh, plane wave states. So it looks something like that at uh, tree level. And then we're interested in the loop corrections to that. Now, uh, at uh, tree level, this uh, form factor, if we take, say, this representative, or this, this uh, <coughs> class of uh, this helicity configuration, it actually is equal to this familiar looking formula. This looks like the uh, three point Park Taylor formula, um, but it's not exactly the same because the uh, momentum conservation is different. And um, instead of having P1 plus uh, P2 plus P3 equal to zero, now it's equal to the negative of the operator momentum, which I just call uh, P Higgs. So uh, <clears throat> it looks like the Park Taylor amplitude, except for this momentum conservation condition. And there are other representatives of this operator that are related by supersymmetry, and they produce uh, matrix elements onto other states in the n equals 4 uh, multiplet. And as Shruti mentioned, you have these Suzy Ward identities. And they don't depend on the coupling constant. So, uh, and in fact, all the three point amplitudes are in the same SUSY multiplet. So, what that means is that uh, F3 at any loop order divided by F3 tree um, is uh, the same for uh, every uh, case that produces a tree level amplitude. So for example, another representative of this operator could be uh, the gluinos. And then you would get uh, gluino amplitudes. So this would be some other operator that is probably something like uh, Gluino bar D slash Gluino. And so the ratio of the loop amplitude to the tree is going to be exactly the same as for this case. So we don't actually need to specify anymore exactly which states we're talking about, as long as we just say that we're going to give like the ratio to the tree. So last time I told you the answer for this integral. And um, I won't repeat it here, but it had some 1 over epsilon squared poles, and it had some dialogues in it. And the full amplitude consists of 
this thing plus uh, cyclic permutations. plus some simpler integrals that only have uh, logarithms in them. Um, <clears throat> so that's when you add up these contributions at one loop, you find that um, sometimes we use M3 to indicate the ratio of the form factor at a given loop order to the tree. And uh, so that result is uh, minus 1 over epsilon squared times uh, squared of ui minus log of ui um, ui plus 1. Remember last time I defined u as uh, s12 over s123? We could also call that u1. And then v is uh, s23 over s123, which we could call u2. And uh, w equals uh, S31 over uh, S123, which is U3. And they all add up to 1, but you get the cyclic symmetry made more manifest if you keep U, V, and W all present. Because uh, under the cyclic symmetry, you know, U1 goes to U2, goes to U3, goes back. There's also, that, that's a, a symmetry of this uh, form factor. It doesn't leave the tree invariant, but supersymmetry relates the case where the two minuses are here to the ones where there are other places. And once we divide by the tree, the answer becomes totally independent of where you put the two negative helicities. So that means that this ratio, and also at higher loops, has a dihedral symmetry. And the dihedral symmetry is generated by two transformations, a cycle and then a flip. And you can pick any flip you want. For example, you could pick uh, U1 to be exchanged with U2 and U3 to do nothing. So this, this is the, uh, gen these are the generators of the dihedral uh, group. D3, which is isomorphic to S3, just the total permutations on these three uh, indices. But I'm not done yet with the amplitude, yeah? Yeah, I'm not uh, summing over it. I, oh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't have to sum over the flip because it's flip symmetric. Yeah, so after I sum over the cycles, the boxes alone have this dihedral symmetry, and there might be some other triangles around, but, but anyway, the whole answer has to be uh, dihedrally symmetric. And there's this piece, and then there's a, um, I'm going to write, split off another piece, which is uh, defined to be two Li2 of 1 minus 1 over u plus uh, Li2 of 1 minus 1 over v plus uh, Li, I guess I could have used the sum notation, but anyway, it's a sum over these guys. And that's also dihedrally symmetric. So that's what the one loop answer is. To go beyond, any questions about this formula? I didn't really totally explain to you how to get it, but this, this is the answer.
and it mostly comes from summing over these integrals. Yep? No. Yeah, it has higher order terms. I think in this case, the worst thing you get are classical LINs, which I introduced before at order epsilon. These integrals are simple enough that you could write them down as a, in terms of LINs and some more logarithms. In more complicated cases, though, it's very, very hard to do the higher order terms in epsilon. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, in the number of external gluons, uh -huh. yeah, uh, D4. So, so if we're in the planar limit, um, where we uh, we basically color order the gluons, and we discuss one piece at a time with specific color orderings, then this Higgs here doesn't really carry any color, so it sits off by itself in terms of color, and then you have a blob. But but these guys have to be color ordered. And because they're ordered, they have the same symmetry as if this Higgs wasn't here in a, like an n-gluon amplitude. And that symmetry uh, for these partial amplitudes in the trace basis, uh, similar to the tree that, that Henrik was giving the color uh, ordering of, it has a cycle symmetry and it has a flip symmetry. Maybe with a sign, but if we divide by the tree, the sign cancels and it's always a plus sign. So, so then if we have, I should have made these gluons running from one to n, this has the same dn dihedral group for n gluons, yeah. Any other questions? Yep. No, this one was computed probably just by, f uh, I think it was actually computed maybe with generalized unitarity back around uh, 2007 or six, somewhere around there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The, uh, the limit when the Higgs uh, mass goes to zero has certain symmetries. There's also a limit where the Higgs mass and momentum both go to zero. So those are two different kinds of limits. The second limit, because the Higgs is interacting through something that looks like the Lagrangian, it's like a Lagrangian insertion. So there are some theorems about the fact that it should more or less go into an amplitude at tree level it should go into the corresponding amplitude. Now the soft Higgs limit in this case takes you from real kinematics to something that only has complex kinematics. If I set the Higgs mass to zero, then I get to the three-point vertices that Yara was talking about, and they're only complex. But if I have four or more here, then, then the Park-Taylor amplitude smoothly goes into the, the Park-Taylor amplitude. There's actually some subtleties I didn't emphasize here. This is not quite the operator. It's really uh, a self-dual part of it. And uh, if you actually use this operator and you go to four point, you get um, an interesting formula at tree level. So F4 tree for uh, minus minus plus plus looks like this. So uh, it looks like Park-Taylor plus uh, Park-Taylor bar. In other words, you can complex conjugate the 4.1 and you know think of these as the two negative helicities before you flip. And when the Higgs momentum is zero, these are the same expression. And the fact that you get something proportional to the tree when you take the Higgs momentum to zero, so that the delta function for momentum conservation looks like the n-gluon amplitude, that's not an accident. 
that's because of this Lagrangian insertion. But at loop level, you have to be more careful because of infrared divergences, commuting with the commutation between small loop momenta and small uh, Higgs momenta. Now the limit that the Higgs mass goes to zero, but the Higgs momentum does not go to zero. Um, there's different interpretations of what that means. So, so you could say it a different way. You could say that I'm taking S and T to infinity, like in this three-point case here. If I have uh, Higgs production kinematics, and I have two gluons coming in, and I have a Higgs coming out, then I can consider limits where mh goes to zero. But I, since it's only the ratio that matters, mh is mh squared is s one two three. That's like taking uh, s the uh, Mandelstam variables to infinity. So there's there's different ways of doing that. Yeah, one of them is a Reggie limit, and it has its own factorization properties and stuff. Okay, so uh, next we need to talk about a little bit of general uh, knowledge that was built up over many decades in QCD of what infrared divergences look like at the multi-loop level. So we could call this general IR uh, factorization in uh, massless gauge theory. And I'm basically just going to draw a picture here. So the uh, IR divergent part looks like a, um, a hard uh, function which does not contain any epsilon. It's finite as epsilon goes to zero. And then there's a product over jet functions for each of the external uh, particles. And these depend on epsilon, but they don't really have much dependence on the kinematics. And then there's a, a soft function that depends on the momenta of the external particles, on all of them. So that's illustrated schematically here. And these things called jet functions, they're divergent because of, of uh, virtual collinear emission. Um, these, like a gluon could split into, into quarks, or maybe there's even another gluon in there and so on. So, so a jet function has a large, this would be inside something we'd call a jet, has a large number of co collinear virtual particles all moving in the same direction. And that's one type of divergence. And then there's also soft divergences which you may be very familiar with from QED. Whenever you have charged particles going off, you can't really uh, define a uh, uh, S matrix that's exact in the number of charged particles without photons. You have to always dress them with a photon cloud. If you don't, you'll kind of get a negative infinity for your loop calculations, or if you exponentiate it, you'll get zero probability. And that comes from the exchange of long range forces, which would be photons and virtual photons in QED or gluons in QCD. 
But in the QCD case, those gluons can interact with each other. But because they're soft, they're very long wavelength, and they don't resolve the jet. So the good news is you don't have to look inside this virtual jet of particles to know how the soft photons couple to it. They just see the color charge of the jet. Now in QCD, the gluons carry color charge, so they can rotate the color charge of the jet. So that means it's a more complicated calculation and also because of the self-interactions, much more complicated than in QED. But in principle, there's this general factorization. But this soft function is still extremely uh, complicated at high loop order because it can connect many different hard partons. Yep. Oh yeah, I just mean it. Uh, it's I just mean it's finite as epsilon goes to zero. It could have uh, higher order terms in epsilon. I forgot to also say, of course, this has epsilon, singular epsilon dependence in it. So then the the nice thing that we get to do that simplifies this whole thing is the uh, NC goes to infinity planar limit. So in that limit, the soft function breaks up and factorizes into stuff that only connects to two color adjacent jet functions. So there may still be one soft function, but it, effectively, it's really multiple soft functions, depending on uh, <clears throat> one for each of these wedges. So in this double line notation, we have these external adjoint particles. And um, because of the planarity, you can actually ask which side of the line did, did any given gluon talk to. And so uh, as far as these uh, soft times jet contributions, they can all be reshuffled. So you can take kind of this square root of the jet and associate it with one side of this line, another square root of a jet and associate it with this side, and then include this soft function too, and define a wedge that goes between leg I and leg I plus one. So then uh, an over an tree, and this would be true for the form factor too, uh, or any n leg amplitude. Um, it just becomes a product of the uh, wedges. But these guys here, they depend on far fewer kinematic variables. They only know about the momenta of these two lines, i and i plus one. And really, because of Lorentz invariance, they only depend on, on that Mandelstam variable, the invariant between uh, the or dot product or invariant between pi and pi plus one. By the way, there's a special case of this formula where the Higgs decays or goes to two gluons. where you just have two lines. This is the N line case, and here's the two line case. I, I should uh, write this as uh, F N and over F N tree. They both have the same divergences. So either the form factor or the amplitude. And uh, then we can rewrite this as uh, the product of uh, I equals one to N of the uh, 
two-point form factor, which depends on SI I plus one. That's what this wedge really is. It's the square root of the two-point form factor. See, in this case, there's two lines. The form factor is two wedges. So the form factor is the square of the contributions of these wedges. So we take the square root, and that tells us what a wedge is. And then we take this product. And this tells us about all the infrared divergences. I should have also mentioned while I was at it that there are no uh, UV divergences. And that's because uh, A, the beta function of n equals 4 is 0 to all orders. And B, operate, this operator is uh, a BPS operator, which is protected from being renormalized. So, so there are no uh, UV divergences. So the only divergences we have are infrared in nature. And in the planar limit, they have this nice uh, factorization. So you get a product of terms that depend on the individual invariants. And you can see this happening at one loop here. This product, if you expand out in the coupling, If you take this product and expand in the coupling, then instead of getting the product, the order g squared term is the sum of these guys, and that's exactly what you see here. But this is just the one loop approximation, and we want to go to all orders. But there was a lot of work on the uh, all orders behavior of these two-point form factors, because they're very important in, in uh, QCD. And uh, and and the infrared behavior exponentiates. In QCD, there's a trickier formula, but in uh, planar n equals four, because the coupling doesn't run, it simplifies dramatically, and. Um, But to keep it simple, I'm, I'm going to skip uh, uh, one other term. To write it out, you have to break it up into more pieces, and it gets a little more complicated, but it doesn't end up mattering too much. So <clears throat> these, uh, the infrared divergences have to do with sort of how things evolve as momenta get soft. And, and there are often factorization and evolution equations that you can derive. And whenever you have such an equation, there's usually an anomalous dimension that controls things. And there are sort of two anomalous dimensions that enter this form factor. And the most important of them is called the cusp anomalous dimension. So the uh, cusp anomalous dimension, it's given that name because it, it's associated with a cusp between two semi-infinite Wilson lines. So if we draw a, a curve like this, where these are uh, both uh, light-like, well, you can define the cusp without these being light-like, but we're interested in the light-like case. And if they meet at a point here, then you can consider the uh, path-ordered exponential around this infinite contour. And it has uh, divergences, which are actually, from the point of view of Wilson lines, they diverge in the UV. They come from gluons that are emitted very close to this singularity. So you need to renormalize them and then uh, 
set up a, a renormalization group equation, and, and that uh, gives you a gamma cusp. So that's very nice that we have a picture for this. Even nicer is that our friends who do integrability um, and uh, there's a um, BES equation which predicts this to all orders. So there's a, a formula that says that gamma cusp, and really it should have been divided by four. Somebody made a mistake early on. Anyway, it comes from computing a matrix called K and inverting it and taking the one one matrix element. But this is a semi-infinite uh, matrix, so uh, you can invert it to any order in perturbation theory uh, that you want. So in that sense, it's known to all orders. But of course, carrying it out exactly to, it can be done to many, many loops. So we, we, know, we know that guy. In fact, just to write it down, it's uh, g squared. We write down the first few terms. Then there's like a minus 2 zeta 2. And then, oops, I forgot the g to the sixth here at three loops. And then at four loops, there's a odd zetas make their first appearance. So, so this is known to all orders. And it controls the leading divergence in the form factor. And through this formula, in the... Uh, uh, endpoint amplitudes and the form factors. There's also some subleading stuff, but because it doesn't have any S dependence that survives at order epsilon to the zero, doesn't matter as much as the cusp terms. So, yeah, question? Yeah. No, the beta function is non-zero, starting at one loop in QCD. So you have running a coupling effects. You have to renormalize your amplitudes in the UV. And also, you can have operator renormalization. And at leading order, this operator, I think it runs with the beta function at leading order. But at higher orders, I think it's a, this particular glute, you know, composite operator uh, has a different uh, renormalization past a certain order. There's also finite matching you have to worry about when you do the phenomenology. Good question. Any other questions? Yeah. So one thing that's interesting is that these zeta values have a transcendental weight. Remember when we talked about the LIN, that it had weight N? These, these zeta values, well, the even ones are, are like pi squared over 6 or pi to the fourth over 90. And pi counts as transcendental weight 1. So if we look at this loop order, we, we see that, and also uh, zeta n is weight n. So we see that at order g to the 2L at L loops, the weight is 2L minus 2. OK? So that, that's a special property of this. Now, if you were asking about the integers, that's a more complicated question. And that comes out of more detailed looking at this uh, K matrix. But this fact of which uh, Riemann zeta values appear here, that's a uh, a very important feature that the weight is 2L minus 2 at L loops. Also, this comes with a 1 over epsilon squared. 
and uh, each kind of one over epsilon subtracts one from, from this. Like if we expanded this out in epsilons, we would get logarithms, and each logarithm is weight one. So it, it's connected with the fact that if you go to the epsilon to the minus two term in an amplitude, you get weight two L minus two. But we're gonna, in a second, we're gonna remove the divergent part and then we're gonna look at the finite parts that are epsilon of zero. And those are gonna be weight two L. And that's a crucial part of the bootstrap uh, approach is that we only look at weight two L functions at L loops. So this is a nice clue. Uh, but these, these are just numbers and we'll get functions later, yeah? Um, well, there are some uh, kind of arguments that you can't get uh, weights that are any higher than that, that were done recently by Andrew McLeod, Matthew Swart Schwartz, Hannah uh, Hofi, Hannah's daughter, Christian Virgu. So there's some arguments that it can't be any higher than that, uh, that it has to be u uniform. It's a uh, proof by brute force. You just keep doing calculations and they never end up being any different. May maybe there are some better uh, arguments. Um, and in low loop orders, you only see these special uniform transcendental integrals, but uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, one more up here. So those divergences we saw included a gamma cusp over four times that function up there minus s to the minus epsilon. And uh, also there was a square root that would turn that minus two into a minus one. But if you look over here, you see there's a minus one and an s to the minus epsilon, okay? So those divergences are actually exactly reproduced by the one loop amplitude. So it's possible to cancel them all by uh, essentially exponentiating this. There's a slightly more complicated formula that fixes the one over epsilon poles at higher, that you have to worry about at higher loops uh, that we're not involved in this collinear anomalous dimension, which I didn't tell you about. But basically we do this. And then, anything that's left over has to be uh, finite. Uh, so we can exponentiate the full one loop amplitude divided by the tree with this gamma cusp, and that captures all the infrared divergences uh, And there's a similar formula for form factors if we just replace the A's by, by F's on both sides here. There's the same formula, okay? Now, uh, this is one choice, but sometimes there are better choices that are, um, um, for example, There, there can be a more minimal thing where you subtract off uh, uh, yeah, in, 
in general, there might be a, a more minimal piece that you can subtract off. So you could also do an over an tree. I just leave the cusp off, it's understood. Uh, so you might take some piece of the one loop amplitude, let's call it an one partial. And you might decide to take this finite function and not put it inside the exponential. So this is just another, this piece is supposed to have all the same poles as this has. Its dependence on epsilon should be the same. But you could change the finite parts and you could shuffle them off. So uh, for the, uh, the case of the three point form factor, the uh, difference between uh, A3 one loop minus uh, A3 tree is, um, I mean, minus the partial part. That's going to be uh, equal to E3, 1, which I wrote up above, but let me just write it again here. 2 times the summation of Li2 of 1 minus 1 over Ui. Now, why I should split off this particular part? You see in the one loop, there was uh, this E1 was there, but there are other pieces I could have imagined mixing them in different ways. Anyway, it's not really obvious what you should do with, say, those logarithms squared of Ui. Uh, it's just this one happens to make uh, uh, certain things work a lot better uh, later. And, and so we didn't know how to do it until we played around a bit once we had some higher loop uh, data. So, but, but it's obvious you can push these things around. Um, but anyway, once, once you do that, you find that for this three point form factor, and this is kind of a, a general relation, um, that there's two normalizations. And um, there's kind of a convention where you define a, a uh, remainder function. And this remainder function has a nice property that it goes to zero in uh, all uh, three uh, collinear limits. Whereas this function has uh, some nicer uh, uh, structural properties, which we'll get to a little later. So anyway, kind of switch back and forth between different uh, schemes. This thing, by the way, um, it actually always vanishes at one loop because you have exponentiated the full one loop amplitude. So it starts at two loops. And this has a one loop term, which is g squared. And when you expand it out the only, to one loop, the only thing you get is this, which matches the one loop here. OK. So that's just uh, different ways of, of defining a finite result that has, um, turns out to have better properties. So now I'm going to introduce generalized polylogarithms. Unless there are any questions before I go on. Yep. So the um, you could do almost the same thing for planar QCD. This business where we got to use the planarity to define uh, wedges. Those wedges relate to form factors. That would still go through. And, and the behavior of the form factors, the poles in that, it's generally understood. And it involves 
the cusp anomalous dimension for QCD, which is known to like four loops, a collinear anomalous dimension for QCD, also known to four loops, and the beta function is probably known to five loops. So you can uh, work out exactly what it is. It's more complicated because there's running couplings inside the integrals, but you can do all of them. Now, once you go beyond the planar limit to QCD for NC equals three, or any other non-planar massless gauge theory, then you have the complications of these soft factors at higher points. And they turn out, in the all-massless case, they're fairly trivial until you hit three loops. And then you get things connecting four external legs that depend on cross ratios. And those were calculated uh, eight to 10 years ago, and, uh, or maybe, maybe a little less. But anyway, uh, so things are sort of understood to about three loops in the all-massless case. Any other questions? So infrared structure of endpoint amplitudes is understood a lot better than the finite parts in other theories. The finite parts are way more complicated. Okay, so there's a set of function called generalized polylogs, which as the name suggests is a, a massive uh, generalization of the classical polylogs that we uh, <coughs> described uh, yesterday. So they can all be defined by depending on some say indices A1 to AN, and then an argument X, and they can be defined recursively by integrating something that is the differential of a logarithm. So it's D log of T minus A1, and you integrate over the same function that has um, argument T, and just you remove the A1 from the index list. Now this integral is not well defined at the bottom endpoint if a1 is zero. So you supplement this with the definition that if I have n zeros in the list, that's uh, one over n factorial times the log, log of x to the n. So you also need to give that definition. Now these ai's and x's can be general functions of the kinematics. And it's possible to, in many cases, define the function space in terms of restrictions of these AIs and how they depend on the kinematics. But there's a more convenient uh, differential definition for the cases we're interested in. Um, I should say there is a lot of work on this maybe back in the 70s by Chen, and then on a lot of the mathematical properties more recently by Goncharov and uh, Francis Brown. So uh, a differential definition, we uh, have a bunch of functions f, and uh, we say that the space is graded 
So splits into different pieces, which have different weights, like the weight we were talking about for the zeta, uh, zeta values. So it could have different weights n. And um, the sort of differential definition of this space that we're going to use is that the total differential of a function of weight n can be split into a sum, a finite number of terms, where there's a logarithmic derivative here. And uh, this thing has weight. Uh, these guys all have weight n minus 1. So we call uh, uh, SK a uh, symbol letter. And they belong to this set, which is called the symbol alphabet. And not just in the n equals 4 world, but also in QCD corrections, at two loops, you encounter uh, many cases where the answers fall into this general class. And once you understand the symbol alphabet, you're a long ways towards uh, working out what the functions are. So uh, this uh, property is kind of a, a piece of, a, of an operation that exists on these spaces of polylogarithms. But there's a more general operation called the coaction. And it's part of a, a Hopf uh, algebra, co-algebra. So an algebra kind of multiplies functions together, two of them to get a single function. A co-action co takes um, a function or a member of this sort of function space, and it splits it into two pieces. And this is one example of it. And we can, we can put some underscores on delta to pick out a piece of this delta <coughs> and uh, write it as a sum uh, So we've basically taken the derivative and remapped it in this form and uh, observed that the logarithm has, well, weight 1 because it's a single integral of dt over t. And then the coefficients that appear in the derivative have weight n minus 1. And that's why we give it this name, n minus 1 comma 1. And this is, uh, for us, the most useful piece of this coaction is kind of from the derivative. Um, but we can also uh, iterate it. And uh, we can define the uh, symbol. I'll write it as an S, maybe with a dollar sign to keep getting confused with some other S's which I may not get to. But anyway, uh, the symbol of a function f is uh, defined using almost the same uh, equation again. Um, but we put the symbols of f, s, k here. And then by convention, when we get a logarithm just to save space, we omit the logarithm. It's understood. So this is an iterative definition of the symbol. Maybe we should start off the recursion on it by remarking that the symbol of just the logarithm is uh, of any letter is SK. So what does this really mean? It means you take the derivatives of a function to figure out the coproducts, or to figure out the last entries. And then you pair them with something that sits in front of them, and then you take its derivative, and you use exactly the same formula 
over and over again in order to compute the symbol. You just keep taking derivatives, but the d log is, when you take a derivative, is kind of a rational function. You don't want to take a derivative of it. So you just take a derivative of the things that sit in front, which we call pure, pure functions, which are these iterated integrals secretly. So at the end of the day, the symbol looks like this. It's a uh, sum over a bunch of indices that labeled the letters running from 1 to n, if this had weight n. And it has some coefficients which have uh, n indices on them. And then they multiply these letters, and we have a tensor product of uh, n of these things for a weight, a weight n function. And these guys here uh, just belong to the rational numbers. And there is a couple uh, simple properties of them. For example, because these letters are logarithmic, if you have a, uh, a symbol term that has an A and a B, the product of them in there, because it's really the logarithm we're writing down, that can be replaced by uh, the same exact expression with just the A plus the same exact expression with the B. And also, suppose we, let's do one simple example. Let's do the symbol of log x log y. Using the Leibniz rule, we can either differentiate y or differentiate x first. If we differentiate y, we get a d log y, so we put a tensor y in the back. And then in the front, we have the thing that was left after we extracted the d log, and that's just log x. But the symbol of a single logarithm is just x. But we could have done the differentiation in the opposite order. I mean, it, it hits. You can, also, you can also differentiate x, and then you get uh, x at the back. So this is the symbol of the product of log x and log y. So uh, if you think about this and use the uh, Leibniz rule for differentiating sort of repeatedly, you will find that the symbol of uh, a product, so now these will be, f and g can be general functions of any arguments um, that you get, uh, you can compute the symbol of the product of f and g by taking the uh, symbol of f and the symbol of g, which will be these tensors, and then you shuffle them. So you, you interleave them uh, keeping the orderings of the ones that came from F uh, intact and the ones that came from G intact, but shuffling all the relative permutations. Exactly the same operation that, that Henrik defined. So you, you shuffle these two guys. And then I should also give the uh, example of the uh, n-fold, or at least the dialog. Let's do the dialog. Any questions about that? Yep. The SIN should be thought of as variables. That, that depend on the, some underlying kinematics. We'll see an example pretty soon. Uh, um, but uh, 
the SIs themselves are not rational numbers, but these coefficients are, uh, these F super S's are rational. That's pointing up to that coefficient there in front. Those are rational. Yeah. So they're related to the symbol letters, but it's not quite so simple. You have to do some way of fiber. In the general case, it's not quite so simple. And in some cases, it's not exactly known exactly how to define the G's properly, even when the differential definition is available. But in simple cases, they're closely related. So in a one parameter, let me, let me give, maybe I should just give a one parameter example. Uh, So I probably have to wrap up in a few minutes, huh? I'll just take a little bit longer. So to answer that, <coughs> or part, give one simple example, um, suppose all the AIs just belong to the set zero and one. Then uh, you're uh, always integrating uh, dt over t or dt over uh, oh, t minus one up there. And um, when you take the a derivative, you find um, that uh, dg or dg that starts with a zero is uh, g deleting that zero times uh, d log x because you get. If a1 is zero, you just get dt over t, and you differentiate, and you get dx over x or d log x. And dg1, anything, is um, drop the one and get d log of one minus x. So according to the definition of the symbol, in this case, the symbol alphabet just consists of, of two letters, x and one minus x. So if you see that this is your symbol alphabet, then you know that you just have this space of G functions. But in the multivariate case, it's a bit trickier to go from the uh, uh, differential definition to the integral one. You have to be careful about how you integrate over different variables. But in some cases, it's known how to do that. And in the, uh, our prototype example, it is too. So, uh, yeah, the, um, let me do the, remember that Li2 of x was defined by an integral, which was minus uh, dt over t log 1 minus t. So, very similarly to this, d Li2 of x, uh, is uh, minus uh, logarithm of one minus x uh, d log x. So the symbol of uh, li2 of x is equal to minus one times uh, a one minus x in the first slot and an x in the last slot. This is coming from here and this is coming from here. And similarly, the symbol of Li n of x, which could be defined by integrating 
uh, many more times is uh, minus 1, 1 minus x, tensor x, tensor x, tensor x, n minus 1 times. So these are some e examples. If we did the general case of these g's with 0 and 1, we could get either x or 1 minus x in any slot. So there are many more of those functions than these. I'll do one, one, just one last uh, equation, which is we had this function Li2 of 1 minus 1 over u. And uh, its symbol, just by plugging in x equals 1 minus 1 over u, is uh, minus 1 times uh, 1 over u tensor 1 minus 1 over u. And you can rewrite that if you want as uh, u tensor 1 minus u over u. A uh, sign in the slot doesn't matter in a given slot. Overall signs matter. And if you also want, you can rewrite this by using that multiplication rule like that. So, uh, so I'll stop there. Well, just write, write one more. <laughs> The, the symbol alphabet for our problem at hand has, at least a one loop, has only six letters in it. So you can see the u and 1 minus u inside Li2 of 1 minus 1 over u. And it might have erased it by now, but you remember it also had a 1 minus 1 over v and a 1 minus 1 over w. So that accounts for all these six letters. So this process is so simple that we find no more letters are necessary at higher loops. That's the complete symbol alphabet. So then next time we'll, we'll uh, uh, discuss uh, more properties of this particular function space and uh, go as far as we can towards uh, bootstrapping or, or uh, constraining the functions in this function space by looking at the pieces of weight 2L at L loop order and imposing a bunch of constraints. So I should stop here. Thank you, Lance. <laughs> Questions? Yes, here is. Uh, so, uh, for the log x, log y example we did above, on the first term, x is a log x, but on the second term, it's just an x. So how can you tell when your x is a log and when it's just an x? If it appears as a slot somewhere inside the symbol, inside yeah. this tensor product, it's always implied that it's a logarithm. So is it only the If we wanted to be more obvious, we would have written logarithms in front of every single slot. Hmm. But they're all logarithms, so why not save a little space and just have the logarithm be implicit? So is it only the first in the product that's a log? So the, the first thing in the, in the product, when hmm. you use the formula recursively, yeah. it could be higher weight. Right. If it's higher weight, it's not a log, it's a polylog. Mm -hmm. But then we apply the relation again. Yeah. And the function spaces we're interested in, every, every time you differentiate, you always get the same set of uh, letters, right. these SKs. So we keep doing it, and we build up a longer string of these, uh, of these uh, letters. Okay. That every time we have the letter in the back, um, in the case here, we wrote the logarithm. That was just the convention. But when we do the symbol, the convention is just to remove the logarithm, because it's understood it's, it's a weight one, and it can only be a logarithm. All right, OK, thanks. More questions? Other questions? Okay. All ready oh. for the gong show, huh? Yeah. <laughs>